I want to share some brief glimpses of how hopelessness is often an illusion, a destructive illusion because hope and hopelessness usually rest with our perceptions of a given situation. For example, in our Terry Tempest Williams reading this morning on the protest in Washington, how many of us would have felt that the wall of armed policemen represented a hopeless situation? But it obviously wasn't. The wall opened and the women in code pink marched through. Think about the misconception in the play we all know, Romeo and Juliet. If you remember, Juliet drank a potion that would only make her appear dead. It brought on sleep for two and 40 hours. She was in a death-like coma when Romeo discovered her. Romeo saw no hope at all, only death. And so he failed to realize that he was not seeing the whole story. Unable to envision a future or, or even imagine any possibilities, all of his hope was extinguished. So Romeo swallows the real poison himself and dies. In his state of hopelessness, the appearance that there was no future, he was completely void of any faith and vision that could save him. Romeo and Juliet is a tragic play because the perception of death, the perception of hopelessness, the perception of no future is not the whole story. In contrast, one of my favorite stories found in the Gospel of Mark takes place with, Ju with Jesus doing some self-promotional work, let us say. He's out there, he's claiming that that the power of God flows through him, and he therefore has the ability to heal anyone who suffers an affliction. Now, his choice of venue to perform miracles is a small synagogue, which, as you can well imagine, was simply packed to the gills. The whole town was jammed with people, and there, believe me, there was no room at the inn anywhere close by, right, but miles and miles and miles away. Along come four guys carrying a paralyzed friend of theirs still in his bed. They see this immense crowd and realize there's no way they're going to get their friend to Jesus for this miraculous cure. The prospect was entirely hopeless. They couldn't get anywhere near the synagogue. Now, if I were one of the four guys, I would have said, hey, guys, you know, we tried. It's a hopeless situation. Let's go home. There's nothing we can do. But it's amazing what a little imagination can do. Hope is what we actively do, not simply waiting around for something to happen. So these four guys, holding on to the paralytic, climb up on the roof of the synagogue, remove some tiles, and lower the paralyzed man right in the exact spot where Jesus was performing his miracles. Pew, bingo. There he was. Jesus was probably startled by the whole thing, but he kept on going, of course. <laughs> Jesus heals him and then utters the very famous line, rise, take your bed, and go home, which is exactly what the man did. Now, these men demonstrate that despite of what they perceived, when they entered town, it was not the end of the story. And there was so much that could have gone wrong, if you think about it. The roof could have caved in. Or heaven forbid, the paralyzed man slides off the bed and becomes a human missile going right towards the crowd. <laughs> but it worked and shows us that passive hope, this passive hope will get you nowhere. Active hope moves you along the journey. One last episode of a different sort. The German-Jewish philosopher Walter Benjamin obtained a visa to escape to the United States in 1940. 
In an effort to elude the Gestapo, he decided to set sail from Portugal, which was a neutral country. To do so, he would have to travel through Spain. He and a few others traveling with him made it safely as far as the Pyrenees, where for some unknown reason, the border patrol closed the gates and no one was allowed to enter. Walter Benjamin, unable to imagining the gates opening again, committed suicide that night in the midst of deep hopelessness. He deemed his future was closed off forever. There were no more possibilities. Except on the very next day, the gates opened again as mysteriously as they had the day before. The group of refugees, without Benjamin, made it safely to Portugal and then to the United States. When the gates of the border were slammed shut, it was not the whole story. Without hope, we never get to asking, what shall we do with all this beauty? Hope opens our eyes to two possibilities, redemption and destruction. So many of us in this congregation are deeply committed to social change, a transformation in our world where justice reigns and peace is restored and the earth's wounds has time to heal. But is our hope for a new world passive or active? How we engage with the future becomes a profoundly spiritual matter. The Trappist monk, Thomas Merton, was on to all this. He knew that struggling to change the world, fighting against great odds, can deplete whatever hope remains in your breast. And so he says that this journey towards ushering in a new world of peace and compassion, this is fundamentally a spiritual journey. You simply cannot be results-oriented. You need to realize that the truth of your work is what matters. The truth of your work is more significant than the outcome. And so this kind of brings us back to my unsuspecting conversation with Terry Tempest Williams over dinner on a warm summer evening. Hope is not something you either have or don't have. Hope, hope lies ultimately in the truth of our own work and the integrity of our character. That's where we find hope. This is its deep and abiding faith. And of course, hope, active hope, carries us along from one day to the next day to the next and just enables us to keep on going. It often feels like hope dangles before our eyes, teasing us a bit, daring us to place our trust in it. It means investing our faith in something not seen, something quite intangible, just a dream of a better future. And therefore, hope, when you come to think about it, is pretty unreasonable. Unreasonable because the arguments that hope exists at all remain unconvincing. But just as hope is unreasonable, so too is it indispensable. Without it, we can't move through a wall of armed policemen at our nation's capital. Without it, we can't work the miracle of healing a paralyzed man. Without it, we are stopped forever at the border gates and never set sail for a faraway land. And without it, we miss the full story and drink the poison. Without hope, we can never summon the courage to ask the question we must, what shall we do with all this beauty? Just know 
that there will be periods in our lives in which the world will grow pretty dark. And that darkness can overwhelm us. But we can't just wait passively for hope somehow to bring change. Our hope must move us spiritually to act. Act with integrity. Act not for the sake of an outcome, but to act with the truth that the world needs far greater compassion and peace. And in times of darkness and despair, our spiritual tank running on empty, may we stop ourselves from spiraling downward and pose the question, what shall we do with all this beauty?